So, funny story. I uh, had the infinite spiral drill equipped while doing the big endgame grind, so I think I mentioned Emily and Tronny are like five or six levels ahead. So I decided to fix that by hanging out in this cave for a couple minutes and just, well, you get the idea. It was very satisfying. But doesn't this make them even further ahead? Because aren't they getting all this experience too? No, they're getting it scaled. They are actually getting the actual EXP from actual enemies that they fight, which for them will be like scaled massively down, and for us will not. So we, we catch up. Game's clever about this stuff. Probably should have taken Apollo and Jern with you, just saying. Hmm. They can catch up themselves. Man. I don't want to think about that. Not after everything we've seen. Instead, let's go talk to some more backers. That's right, after literally the entire game, it's finally time to engage with the last minute heroes. And by engage, I just mean do some encounters. Don't worry, it's all very simple. It will, however, require us for some reason to go and actually visit the headquarters, which I guess is fair enough. There's not, strictly speaking, been any reason to do that this far. They had to send us there at some point, right? Anyway, I guess this means that there are, like, literally only two guilds actively using Autumn Residences. Maybe we're supposed to believe that there are people in the other buildings that we can't go into. Yeah, that seems... It seems like the guild system is thoroughly, I don't want to say unexplored, but it seems like a thing that was included, like, purely for flavor reasons, and they're just sitting there begging, begging you please not to think about it too hard, about how you've literally only seen one guild in the entire game. Well, two now. Anyway, these these two, I'm not sure what they did, but they aren't just backers, they're actually in the special thanks. This, by the way, is the guy who made all the video guides that the one guy in the bar is plugging. It's actually that guy. So of course they have a whole quest. Also pretty sure that he and Puella Doctor are up some kind of a thing, IRL. I mean, yeah, I guess we're expected to believe that uh, they're just good friends with the developers and they have inside information of some kind which allows them to do their last minute shtick. I don't really know what to make of that. Man, even in the year 4000 and whatever, Steam never changes. So yeah, this is, I guess, 
life with the last minute heroes. A whole bunch of just going on duty and waiting around for people to get into trouble. And then bailing them out. It's a niche, I guess. I mean, the role players do take uh, this sort of thing very seriously. I will give them that. Deadly serious. I choose to believe that we're going to get kicked out of their guild at some point because we're going to arrive with like a minute 30 before they would have otherwise died and that's just unacceptable. I am pretty certain that they would rather actively let people die than show up even a second early. Anyway, yes, we are actually uh, waiting in real time for something to happen. Fortunately, we're not waiting very long, but we do have to wait. I'm a little disappointed that there's no timing gimmicks here. Like, we are scripted to show up at the last minute, but there's no real uh, mechanical representation of having to time our arrival. Yeah, no, absolute missed opportunity that there wasn't, like, a two-minute timer in the top right that was counting down, and you failed the quest if you got there before 60 seconds. Basically, like, we've all, we've all done the thing with Cruising Shadow, right? We know how this goes. Uh, that was the alternative level 3 wave dash part. It's weird. They make a big deal about it so you're, you're charging up a dash, but basically it's just hitting people with the peel-out animation. That's what actually does the damage. You don't move. So it's uh, a little weird to actually hit people with. Not a bad tech, though. Well, uh, job done, I guess. Let's do it again. Is it going to occur to me that I can just teleport back to the landmark? No, it is not. Oh well. Northeast Path is a couple screens away from here. I would like to note that uh, we literally just walked the one screen back from the previous path back to the cave-in. And this guy has managed to... Well, he's gone a long way in a very short time and gotten into a lot of trouble. I guess we can't fold his dedication. Anyway, by now, we're a... Well, you saw what our level is. We've got our tech situation thoroughly in order. We put some effort into getting the good gear from Rhombus Square, so... Uh, the unboosted samurai bugs are pretty firmly not a problem anymore. saving you, man. Oh, I should note that, again, Flower Lake is, well, here it is. 
this quite works quickly. I guess also I should maybe hedge against the possibility that there is someone watching who doesn't know what kiting means. It's very unlikely, but it's a thing from MMOs, primarily, where you aggro a bunch of enemies and then draw them into position. It's used for getting a larger number of enemies together than you'd otherwise would. I've done it in this LP, in this cave actually. It was very fun, if you can manage it, but uh... Well, on the subject of managing it... So, this fight is kind of carnage. Even prepared as we are. I'm very sorry to Emily, by the way. This is uh, probably a little bit rough. I know we've already done bump therapy, but... Mm. This is pushing it. Godspeed, Emily, do your best. Incidentally, this is one of the very few quests in which uh, all of the available party members have the dialogue for. But uh, Apollo and Germs isn't as funny as Emily and Johnny's, so... Mm. Well, I say Emily and Tronny, so it's, it's really just the, the humour inherent to traumatising Emily again. Everyone else is just a bit broke about this. I feel like that's a bit understandable. This is, what, like the 50th time that we've fought the, uh, the samurai bugs? Something like that. Anyway, that's not a real combat art. That's not a thing that anybody can do. This guy is clearly cheating again. So yeah, the, the Bakicon stuff, in case you've forgotten, is like level 20 to 25-ish. This place is level 50. Also, like, my dude, you can find equipment lying around. I, I don't know... I don't know how it's even plausible to be in that situation. Maybe a little bit of a game design license from the writers there. And that's how that one guy got blocked from the last minute heroes. Tales of Crossworlds. Honestly, it probably would actually be interesting to just have a bunch of quests that are just random shit that happened in guilds today. I mean, that would require them to have more than one guild, so that seems like yeah. not going to happen anytime soon. Anyway, here's an example, in case we needed another one, of kiting. These groups are all normally totally independent, but they will all follow you. And uh, it's very dangerous to fight as many spiders at once, but uh, fortunately we've got excellent crowd control capabilities. Yeah. 
seriously, I cannot overstate how satisfying it is to land these. And with our current build, we can pretty much fire them off indefinitely. It's a hell of a thing. Of course, we're not using level 20 gear, so, you know, what are you going to do? And even at this point, that was still enough to get us a level. Those spiders are how we grind. Anyway. Tiny bit of cleanup before we move on. There are a bunch of uh, chests like this in Sapphire Ridge that they're not hidden. It's just surprisingly easy to miss them. And those are always the worst. Then of course there's Gaia's Garden in which, well, nothing is particularly hidden, but of course the place is massive, so in a way everything is hidden. This screen in particular is kind of a nightmare. There's just... There's just too much stuff on this screen. There's too many mushrooms, and they all look like they're at the wrong elevation. This is a staircase. Making the wrong jumps here is like... Incredibly irritating. I'm also a fan of how we're always unlocking these little shortcuts to get to the places where the chests were, even though there's, like, even by our usual standards, there's no reason to ever want to get back to any of those ledges. I, I honestly think it's just the level designers just can't help themselves at this point. So even the developers of CrossCode are too deep in CrossCode. They stared too deep into the level design abyss. We just... pathologically... always must be unlocking shortcuts back, even when there's nothing to unlock a shortcut back to. We do it for the love of shortcuts. Game design. Game design forever. Anyway, that. This chest here, on that particular island, is one that vexed me for ages my first time playing through this game. I, I think it was, like, actually the last chest I figured out how to get to. Anyway, most of the side quest chains in this game get cut off after a couple quests, and never get revisited again, but of all people, it's the Arid Breeze that gets a standard issue endgame quest. Remember that temple that we partially unlocked? And it was like, yeah, there's really obviously a thing here, but we're gonna have to come back later. And unlike, like, I don't know, the, the weapon smuggling in Rookie Harbor or the Goat Father that all just got completely forgotten, this is the one that we come back to. Uh, just between us, uh, just wait for the DLC, okay? We'll get there. Anyway, the fact that this quest has been held back for this long might give you some indications of what kinds of things we can expect from it. One of those things is going to be walking the whole way back through this. There's no shortcut. Not that it really needs a shortcut, because there's not a whole lot to this place, but... Yeah. Even with all the fights turned off, it's just a bit of a trek. I mean, it could be worse. Yes. I've seen things like this that have the unfortunate tendency to make you redo the puzzles. Hmm. Yeah, can you imagine? So yeah, shocking everyone. 
there's a path through this quicksand patch. Surprise, extra dungeon! I was actually about to say that I'm surprised this wasn't instanced. Right? The space above wasn't really much of a puzzle space. It was just a bunch of fights, and those are, like, it's fair enough to do those in a party. But, uh, this uh, really did actually need to be an instance. So yeah, welcome back to the bubble gimmick. This time crossed over with Wave. We're teleporting and we're doing puzzles. It's great. I'm not even being sarcastic, this is actually good. Oh man. The altitude changing torches. Haven't seen those in fucking forever. Yep. And you know what else? We get an entirely original moth. They have uh, pretty much the same gimmick as the other moths in that they, they float high up and you've got to use the pulse to hit them, but they also require you to teleport in order to dodge their lasers, like those one... like, like the sniper guys from uh, Zerbatar Temple. It's a nice little mix of gimmicks. Their lasers are actually also pretty standardly difficult to dodge. So, there's that too. Also, uh, an observation that I have is that uh, the three kinds of moth, the three varieties of laser moth, are respectively called Pada Moth, Darf Moth, and now Sander Moth. And I'm just... Ordinarily, in literally any other game, I would write it off as a coincidence of like, yeah, we just jammed some noun bits together and made a name. But... This is crosscode, and it doesn't get that benefit of that doubt, so I'm gonna go ahead and say that that is a deliberate attempt to make an extremely sly Star Wars joke. Only an attempt? You will not convince me otherwise. I say attempt to hedge against the possibility of having to frame it as a success. You tell me. Oh, I mean, they, they made a Star Wars reference. Whether or not they're proud of it is a completely different question. This is a fun puzzle. I like it. A whole lot of incredible trickshot bullshit, and it mixes up different element gimmicks. This has been a great little triple element dungeon. Although only just barely triple element, we've only had to use fire for like one bit of one puzzle. Broadly it's a pretty definitely wave of ice. Especially with these enemies. They're doing the standard thing of giving us progressively more and more involved rooms. Incidentally, I haven't tried, I didn't think to try, uh, hitting these guys with Eternal Winter from the floor, because that certainly is an art that can uh, transcend elevation. It probably would stun them immediately if you managed to hit them with that, that is, unless they dodged it. Oh well, we'll never know. Also, I would like to note that uh, it isn't just your ordinary charged shots that can travel up the poles, your techs can as well, and they all behave completely consistently. Like if you do, if you fire a shot that bursts, and you fire it up one of those poles, the whole shot will go up the pole and it will burst at the higher elevation. It is Extremely situational, but uh, probably involved in some kind of ludicrous speedrun tech for this fight. I don't know this for certain, but also, I know this for certain.
By the way, did you notice that these moths all have uh, vision cones while they're targeting, whereas the sniper guys from Zervatar Temple didn't? This is important. You can't just teleport. You have to teleport from inside the vision cone to outside. Otherwise, it won't trick them. This is crucial information. And this is, uh, sure something. Oh, come on. What is the worst that could possibly happen? So, Sand Snowman? Sand Snowman. It's a Sandman. Fuck it, why not? So, this is uh, particularly video games. We've got these fairly discreet little platforms. He's got a lot of area attacks, and he's got a very wide vision cone. All of that said, the actual uh, intended progression here is not really very complicated. It's you get him stunned the same way you get many of anything else here stunned, and then you hit him in the back with melee. It must, by the way, be melee. Charge shots will not break him, even when he's stunned. I uh, may have learned this the hard way a couple times. Also, I'm not sure exactly how set his pattern is. We saw there he went and he did you know, the one attack that we can exploit pretty much straight away in the second phase, but he might also have not done that. I don't know how scripted that part of it is. Another little mystery for the ages. Anyway, you might have noticed that this guy's a uh, kind of a issue. He hits pretty hard. They're not kidding about the level requirement. It's possible that uh, this might not be the first take of this fight that we're seeing. This was a heroic attempt at a skip, but just barely wasn't able to get it. Well just barely by the standards of, you know, the typical damage output of Eternal Winter. Probably could have gotten it if I, like, properly spec for it and eaten some food. On the other hand, I think that uh, the fight from the, the Twilight Master fight has given us all the skip exposure that we really need to see in 1LP. Also, I really, really wanted to get a boss kill with Gatling Artillery. The gulf between how fun it is to use and how effective it actually is, is uh, tragic. But uh, you can get stuff done with it, if you know what you're doing. Or if, you know, you get handed a freebie. It's all good. All of the texts in this game are good, it's just some of them are... Some of them are really good. And some of them are Ether Snipe. Also, uh... Hmm. I was tempted to see if, uh, if they could die, but I'm pretty sure that their health recovers too quickly for them to die from that. So what did we actually get out of all of that? Like, did we even actually get that treasure, or...? Yeah, we got the treasure. It was a key item drop. It didn't show up again as the, the actual sprite, but it did drop from the boss. No one's really sure what the hell it is, but it's definitely very powerful and valuable and historically significant, so... Mm. job done. And, I don't know, looking at Leah's expressions, I'm pretty sure that flattery isn't completely useless against her.